Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, where I run the Future of the Middle Class Initiative and the Center on Children and Families. I'm really grateful that you've all joined us today and hope that you're all uh, keeping safe and healthy in these trying times. Uh, approximately nine months ago, uh, the equ economic equivalent of an asteroid uh, hit uh, the US economy in an exogenous shock um, in the form of the pandemic, which along with the loss of human life and the isolation that has been caused and the public health concerns, obviously a dramatic shock um, for the US economy and indeed to the global economy. One of the consequences, of course, has been uh, some impact in uh, the revenue of various branches of government, not least state and local government. Early predictions of a catastrophe in terms of the balance sheets and revenues of state and local governments were not thankfully realized. Nonetheless, as you'll hear um, from the panel uh, who are about to be introduced to you, and um, there has been a negative impact. Uh, that impact has varied between different places and in many cases may be more important than uh, in other downturns, not least because of the impact on education. As we think about the long run impact of the pandemic and the associated economic costs uh, for the nation, the loss of learning uh, that we're seeing, particularly for those from less advantaged backgrounds is significant. And of course, that is an area where support will be helpful. So what has happened is that we've seen an accentuation of a permanent question, which is how best should federal governments support states and local governments, not only in times of crisis, such as the one we're in now, but more generally. This is a question of politics and a question of policy and a question of economics. And it's one that's in the headlights right now, um, but also one that is the subject of ongoing policy concern. And, and you're gonna hear from the leading scholars uh, in this field about the different ways we should think about helping uh, states and localities and the different approaches that we should take to it. I will say at the very beginning that one way uh, to help um, state and local governments is purportedly to remove the cap on the state and local uh, tax deduction, which was introduced uh, in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That is a bad way, uh, in my view, and I, I, hope, I think in the view of most people who've looked at this, um, the experts you're going to hear from, that's a bad approach, although it is one that's been um, suggested by uh, leading politicians. Um, including Chuck Schumer, um, set to be, of course, Senate Majority Leader. And that is not to say that it isn't the right question, how best should we be helping state and local governments? It's just that that's not the right answer. And so the purpose of today's event um, is to come up with some better answers, more sustainable answers and um, fairer answers, answers that, um, that are better grounded uh, in fairness and in economic efficiency. And so that's what we're gonna hear from. There'll be some publications associated with some of these presentations as well, and an ongoing debate here at Brookings. Please fire in your questions uh, using the hashtag uh, salt deductions uh, as a kind of reminder of uh, the place not to go for the kind of reform uh, or using the usual email events at brookings.edu. Um, and with that introduction, it's my great pleasure now to hand over to my colleague, um, Bill Gale, who runs the Tax Policy Center, the Senior Fellow in Economic Studies and uh, runs the Tax Policy Center, which is a joint center of course, between Brookings and the Urban Institute um, to moderate our, our panel today and lead us through this discussion. So, all right. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're aware that there are some other things going on this afternoon that might be of tangential interest uh, to some people. Uh, but we're here to talk about state and local governments and uh, the federal government and the relation between the two of them. Uh, we have four uh, excellent presentations lined up. Uh, I'm going to introduce the speakers real quickly now and then ask people to simply move through their presentations. Our, our first talk will be by Louise Shainer. Uh, she's my colleague here at the Brookings Institution. She's the Robert S. Kerr Senior Fellow in Economic Studies uh, and the Policy Director for the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy. Uh, before joining the Brookings, uh, she had a long career at the Federal Reserve Board. She served as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy in the Treasury Department, and she worked at the Council of Economic Advisors and the Joint Committee on Taxation. So uh, she will talk about the situation facing state and local governments uh, and some aspects of their recent actions. Our second speaker will be Josh 
Bivens. He's the head of research at the Economic Policy Institute. He's appeared widely in uh, print media and television and radio. And uh, in the past, he served as assistant professor of economics at Roosevelt University. Uh, Tracy Gordon is our third speaker. Uh, she's a senior fellow at the Urban Institute and the uh, Tax Policy Center. Uh, she formerly worked at the Brookings Institution at CEA and the Public Policy Institute of California. Our last speaker is Josh McCabe. He's at the Niskanen Center. Uh, he's also assistant professor of sociology and assistant dean for social sciences at Endicott College. Uh, I'm eager to get to the talk, so I'll, I'll, I'll sum up here and turn it over to Louise. And then after the conversations, uh, after, the, after the talks, we'll have a uh, general discussion and, and uh, take questions from the audience. Okay, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, well, thanks for having me. So today I'm going to talk about the fiscal effects of COVID-19 on state and local budgets. Um, so why, do we, why should we worry about state and local revenues in the first place? So uh, I'm thinking about it really in, with respect to COVID. So balanced budget requirements uh, mean that when revenues fall, uh, you need to either cut spending or increase taxes, unlike the federal government who can just borrow. So that is bad for a number of reasons. One is bad for people in the state. What you really wanna do when you're hit with a shock is smooth through it by borrowing. Um, state and local governments can't do that. It's also bad for the economy. And the state and local governments are a very big player in the economy. They account for 13% of employment um, the extremely slow recovery in, state and, in the state and local sector following the Great Recession really was a major factor slowing the overall economic recovery. Um, so one thing that, that, that you, know, you learn, though, is that this recession is really different. So last spring, many people were warning about absolutely monumentally huge revenue losses, given the surge in unemployment that we saw in the CBO forecast for continued high unemployment. It turns out the losses have been quite a bit smaller than anticipated. One reason is unemployment fell faster than, than CBO had thought. But I think maybe even more important is that the relationship between unemployment and revenues are just very different this recession than in the past. So for one reason, this recession is an especially low income recession. All recessions are hit low income people worse, but this one is especially so, um, meaning that the loss of tax revenue is smaller. So it's terrible for inequality, this case shaped recovery, but it's, it helps on tax revenue. Um, similarly, the CARES Act expanded unemployment benefits much more than had ever been done in a previous recession. And in most states, unemployment benefits are taxable. So even though unemployment was high, taxable income didn't fall commensurately. Third, unlike other recessions, the stock market has done quite well, well and the housing market has done well as well. What does that mean? It means that capital gains taxes and property taxes are robust, whereas in previous recessions they have been not. So all those things are reasons why income tax revenues, although they have been affected, have been affected much less than in the past. On the other hand, there have been much larger declines in sales taxes and other taxes like excise taxes as consumption has fallen. And particularly, there's a lot of tax revenue that um, state localities get from transportation, gas taxes, uh, airport taxes, things like that, parking. Um, and that's just been decimated. All right, so it's a really, so, so the, the magnitudes are different and, and the composition is way different than in previous recessions. So, but when you add it all up, what is the condition of state and local budgets? Well, that's hard to know. Um, I have done some work. I did a work with the BPA paper with Bill Gale, Alan Auerbach, and Byron Lutz, and I've kind of recently done some back of the envelope um, re-estimates. And I think a reasonable estimate is that state and local revenue losses will be about $300 billion over three years starting in 2020. Now, state and local governments have received about $400 billion in federal aid. So they've received more in aid than, they, than they've lost in general revenue losses, but that aid wasn't meant to cover general revenue losses. It's not perfectly flexible, but probably it's relatively flexible. And there's a lot of uncertainty about that. The other thing is it's unclear how much expenses have increased because COVID clearly also created some new expenses, right? So it may be that they got enough aid to cover the revenue losses, but not enough to cover the revenue losses and their expenses. And then finally, this is for the nation as a whole. Clearly some states, particularly those dependent on tourism and energy are much harder hit. And even within a state, you might say the state as a whole is doing okay, but localities may not be doing it or, or, or transit authorities may not be doing okay. It's not clear that the money flows around in the way to sort of to the way that you might expect. Um, one thing that's, that's interesting is that if you think about the great recession revenue losses and this, and this recession, the revenue losses were just much 
uh, they're much smaller this time. So I estimate that sort of inflation adjusted own source revenues will be about three and a quarter percent last year's in, in 2020, about three and a quarter percent 2019 levels, and then be about back to 2019 um, by 2021, lower than they would have expected pre-recession, but just in terms of the level. In the Great Recession, real revenues fell about 8% and stayed below that level for years. So in terms of revenue losses, this is clearly much smaller than the Great Recession. What's so interesting is that the employment declines are much bigger this time around. So let me just quickly tell you, so these are state employment on the left, local employment on the right, solid lines are this recession, dotted lines are the Great Recession, green is education, and blue is non-education. So what you see is, first of all, the solid lines are on the bottom for both education and non-education, state and local. So employment declines have just been much larger, however you look at it. Um, and education uh, at the state level has fallen really dramatically and sort of non-education and education have fallen, fallen a lot. So compared to the Great Recession, that top line, the declines in employment are much larger and much swifter, right? It took a long time last time for an employment decline. Why is that? So I think one of the main reasons is really about social distancing. So schools go virtual, they don't need bus drivers, they don't need cafeteria workers, parks were closed, DMV is operating but half capacity. There's just less need for um, employees. And so I think that's part of the reason. There is some evidence, not next slide, I changed my slide to this slide, um, sorry, <laughs> that tight budgets affect lo local education employment. So if I look at um, so these two slides on the left is local education employment changes um, since the beginning of the year and revenue losses that we projected as a share of own source revenues. And so the states that have larger revenue losses do have larger reductions in local um, education employment. And if you look at how about, how about states that got more aid, the more aid you got, the less you cut local education employment. If I do this for other kinds of employment, state employment of any kind, local non-education non non employment, it doesn't work. I only see this on local education employment. So does that mean that like more aid wouldn't, wouldn't help increase spending? No, I don't think so. More aid would likely help increase spending substantially. So one, as I said, local education is clearly affected by aid, so more aid would help increase spending on education. And as Richard mentioned, I think one of the one of the worst aspects of this recession is the impact on poorer kids of this going virtual. You know, they have lost a year of schooling. There's widening inequality and in how much learning has gone on by income. Um, this will require, particularly once we're not virtual anymore, a lot of money to remediate as well as some creativity. And I really think that's the biggest place where we need to focus on. You know, and the fact that it's hard to find an empirical relationship between spending on employment and other kinds of employment besides local education doesn't mean that it's not about money, right? States are all different. They're making different choices. They were really, really scarred by the Great Recession and how difficult it was and how long revenues were low. And I think they're just very nervous. Um, and, you know, the outlook is really unclear. We have a vaccine now. How long is it going to take to get vaccinated? Will it? Will there be another will it, series of lockdowns? Will the vaccine work long term? So I think that they're just being very, very cautious and more money would help reassure them that it's OK to start spending again. And then, as I said before, some state and local governments are clearly in financial distress and more money would help. OK, thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll pass it over to Josh Bivens. Thank you. Um, can everyone hear me? I think I've taken myself. Um, I'll try to be um, relatively quick. I'd say I, I think this is a really timely discussion. I think it's, I, I agree that allowing unlimited deductibility of state and local taxes from federal income taxes is not the most uh, efficient and progressive way that I would try to transfer fiscal resources to states um, from the federal government. And I do think, unless um, policymakers hear, more efficient direct ways to do that transfer. They're going to be really tempted to go back to uncapping that. So uh, I'm happy to be a part of this discussion. Um, I'll just say a couple of things. Um, I do think there is some, you know, it's really bad timing for, um, you know, the, the unlimited deductibility of state and local taxes was not a great way to transfer fiscal resources to states. To take it away, just as that need became ever greater is really bad timing for, for um, state and local government. So I think we should try to deliver something quickly. I would say the two things I'm, I'm just going to talk about in my time um, is that since 2008, it's become really clear that this federal aid to subnational governments, um, one, 
it should be, there should be triggers. It should be automatic. It should not depend on ad hoc decisions by Congress. I think that's just an obvious clear lesson. I'd also argue though, that the sort of post 2008 experience should also make us think that the federal government should take on more of the nation's overall fiscal burden going forward, even in normal times. Um, and so those are gonna be sort of two of the things I, I argue about. So the easier argument first, using state aid as an automatic stabilizer, not being dependent on sort of ad hoc congressional um, decisions. You know, we know from the really high quality empirical work looking at provisions in the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, that federal aid to state and local governments, it works really well when it flows. Um, you know, I, I think you could see it if in some of uh, Luisa's slides, like you actually see state and local employment hold up pretty well during the actual recession. And it even holds up pretty well until sort of mid 2010. Then as the R provisions that provided aid to state and local governments dry up, um, you start to see the state and local sector become a very big drag on growth. Um, in fact, if you look at how long it took to regain pre-recession levels of unemployment and you compare growth in state and local spending per capita and the recovery from the great recession, with other recent recessions, say from the 1980s on, you can basically say that this sort of state and local spending austerity by itself probably delayed recovery by about three or four years relative to what would have happened if we had just followed sort of historic norms and how quickly state and local spending usually grows following a recession. So it, it was a very big deal. Um, you know, the evidence that this needs to be automatic is just the experience of the Great Recession. As soon as the discretionary aid of ARA went away, it became a big drag on growth. And honestly, you know, I would even say so far in sort of the COVID inspired recession, or I don't know if we're in a, anyway, since the COVID crisis began, um, there's been no general state aid. Uh, Luis points out that there's been lots of sort of targeted state and local aid that might even add up to cover the revenue losses. I think her point that there are spending needs that have probably increased a lot um, given COVID is really well taken. I mean, the flip side, of the fact that this was a low wage recession, meaning revenues fell less. I think it also means the human needs were greater um, because of the recession, because you're talking about an affected population that was much less likely to have a buffer stock of savings. Um, and the fact that COVID has just been such a disaster for education and it's required all sorts of rejuggling of how we actually try to educate kids, especially kids who have the highest needs. I think um, just looking at revenue losses would be understating the fiscal distress um, that this has put on states. And I think that was a really good point that she made. Um, so I think, you know, we, we really want triggers going forward. We want aid to be um, at least some good tranche of aid to be delivered more automatically. And then finally, I'll just um, say, I do think the growing literature on sort of chronic demand shortfalls facing the US economy, whether you call that secular stagnation, the falling neutral interest rate, um, I think it needs to be taken pretty seriously when you talk about, um, sort of overall fiscal policy, sort of the combination of federal, state, and local. Um, I think basically what this means is we're gonna need a more flexible approach to how we think about overall national fiscal balance over the business cycle. And we likely should be willing to tolerate larger deficits during normal times than we may have been comfortable with in the past. I think budgeting rules along with some real economic constraints mean that um, state and local sectors is gonna have a hard time tolerating larger deficits during normal times. That's really gonna be a job um, for the federal government. They could just do it themselves without running resources through state and local governments. But if you think the services provided by state and local governments are valuable, and I do, I think it just makes natural sense to increase sort of the baseline level of um, federal aid there. Um, I would say, I think there's two other reasons. These are maybe more political, less economic, um, why the federal government is better poised to take on more of the fiscal burden going forward. First, um, between state variance and the quality of services delivered by state and local governments is starting to look like a real problem. Maybe it's always been a real problem, but you know, the state heter heterogeneity in dealing with the crush of unemployment benefit seekers over this crisis, it was really hard to see. I mean, if you were in a state with a really low performing unemployment insurance system, you waited months and months to get the aid you were entitled to. That seems pretty unacceptable to me. Um, second, even if we get back to an era, and so to, if the federal government can provide resources across all states, maybe you can reduce or, or at least bring up some of the low performing states. Second, even if we get back to an era where I think all, you know, most public spending, all public spending should be tax financed rather than debt financed in normal times. If we think there is a value to having taxes be progressive, I think the federal government faces far fewer constraints in raising significant amounts of revenue progressively than state and local governments do. 
you know, I think claims of millionaire migration due to high tax rates in a given state are, are way overblown. And yet it just seems obvious to me that this is going to become a risk at the state level far before it becomes a risk at the federal level. Um, I'll mostly stop there. I will say in terms of how we construct automatic um, triggers for state aid to state and local governments, how we increase the, the baseline level of federal aid to those governments, I'm pretty ecumenical. I think there's tons of good levers out there that, that could be used. Um, I've got some opinions on, on what they precisely should be, but to me, the, the bigger issue is just the overall um, sort of, you know, the overall view that this needs to happen, that we need better automatic stabilizers. The state and local sector is an obvious way to do it. And we need a larger part of the nation's fiscal burden borne by the federal government going forward. And so I, I will wrap up there and I'm going to pass it over to Tracy Gordon. Hi there. Um, okay, I'm going to share some slides very quickly. Um, I think my comments are going to be very complimentary to what you've already heard from Louise and Josh. Um, this is a joint work with Len Berman and Nikita Ayuri, and we should have a blog summarizing some of these thoughts coming up uh, soon, as well as some more work in this area. Um, oh dear. Uh, there we go. So uh, as Louise mentioned, economic shocks can be very harmful to state budgets. Um, these are some data that my colleague Lucy Dedian collected from state revenue estimators. So these are monthly data providing some of the most timely and accurate information that's available on state revenues. And she basically found that uh, the initial shocks from this downturn were greater than in the Great Recession. Personal income taxes fell by about 40% initially. State sales taxes fell by about 15% compared to about 30% and 14% in the Great Recession. Now, as Louise points out, a lot of these revenues came back. Um, some of them were mechanical, basically caused by the filing deadline extensions that the federal government implemented and then states soon followed. Um, but it's hard to overstate the enormous uncertainty that existed in the second quarter of 2020 and how states really had to adjust very quickly to an abrupt um, and very deep revenue loss. As Louise points out and Josh pointed out, um, states are constrained by balanced budget rules. Um, and so their actions, either cutting spending or raising taxes can harm the overall economy. Um, we see this right now where state and local governments have detracted about 0.4 percentage points from GDP growth over the last two quarters during the Great Recession from the uh, middle of 2009 all the way through 2013, their contribution to GDP growth was either negative or zero. And building adequate reserves or insulating themselves against uh, budget shocks is difficult at the state level. So states and cities both went into this downturn with record high savings in their rainy day fund. However, there was a lot of variation around that average. So Wyoming uh, famously has reserves that are above its budget because of uh, revenues from severance taxes. Um, Illinois was closer to zero. And there are well-known reasons why it's difficult to amass savings at the state level. There are political inhibitions against having too much of a surplus around, uh, pressures to rebate those savings, or on the converse, you can see uh, governors basically having pressure to spend money um, to help secure re-election, and there's support in the academic literature for that. Um, so there are structural features that could improve the design of rainy day funds, but it's hard for states to get the political um, wherewithal to implement those changes. So things like uncapping uh, rainy day funds or establishing clearer rules around deposits and withdrawals. It's also not straightforward economically how you should exercise that option value to use your rainy day funds. Um, basically, if you use your rainy day fund this year, then you don't have it around next year. And so I think um, some of the sort of psychological scarring that Louise mentioned um, can come into play here. And it's just not a straightforward question. Um, also difficult is timing and targeting discretionary federal assistance. After the federal government acted very swiftly and decisively in March and April, enacting $2.6 uh, $2 trillion worth of total aid, about $240 billion that was uh, geared towards state and local governments, although not all of it um, unrestricted, um, which is the biggest bang for the buck as CBO and other analysts have found. Um, that, that assistance meant a lot, but then nothing happened uh, for eight months. And that, again, led to enormous uncertainty at the state and local level as they had to develop their budgets uh, without knowing whether more assistance would be forthcoming. Um, work by uh, Jeff Clemens, um, uh, Ippolito, and Boyger show that 
uh, it's also difficult to time the assistance. So we now have an increase in federal reimbursement for Medicaid costs that's tied to the declaration of a public health emergency. As soon as that public health emergency is over, that aid will also be over. And it's hard to know if that will be timed correctly with state fiscal conditions. So right now, that's acting as unrestricted aid. States are getting enough money to cover both the enrollment increases caused by the economic downturn and to have um, funds that they can um, then use to support what they otherwise would have spent so they can redirect their funds to other purposes. But again, the timing is, is difficult. It's not necessarily tied to the fiscal conditions of states. So we propose an alternative. Um, we would like to direct funds from the tax expenditure or the foregone federal revenues from either the full or partial salt deduction, and that amounts to about $80 billion to $100 billion a year, to a state macroeconomic insurance fund, or the SMIF. Um, and the SMIF would be governed by the SMIC, the State Macroeconomic Insurance um, Council. And, uh, and basically would make automatic payments to states in recession based on a formula that's tied to economic conditions not revenue forecasts, not deviations from revenue forecasts, but something that's objective and not politically manipulable. Um, importantly for federal budget treatment, it would be considered a non-budgetary account or a deposit fund. So the contributions um, to the fund would be considered outlays when they're made, uh, not when the payments are actually dispersed. And any additional revenues, for example, if states pay premiums, um, would be recorded with offsetting outlays. Um, so this is similar to the federal budgetary treatment of loan guarantees and basically would ensure that federal policymakers could not raid the fund as with Social Security, for example. Um, so uh, the SALT uh, tax expenditure is quite large and that would be enough for a robust countercyclical fiscal assistance program. But you could make it more like insurance if you wanted states to pay a premium that was tied either to uh, their utilization of the fund or projected utilization, um, or if you wanted to have it somehow related to fiscal capacity on a declining or a sliding scale. Um, we would want the fund to pay out only for large emergencies. So a condition of participation would be that states maintain some minimum reserves. And this could be a way of harmonizing the rules around rainy day accounts as well. Um, and that would function similarly to a deductible and insurance market. You could also require that states contribute some amount uh, to solving their budget crises. And that would be similar to coinsurance in an insurance model. Um, a frequent concern with insurance is moral hazard. And that often comes up with uh, so-called bailouts of the state and local sector. Um, I would point out there's two kinds of moral hazard, ex ante and ex post. So the ex ante moral hazard is that states would expect federal assistance and therefore uh, not take precautionary measures. Um, if we have uh, conditions that are tied to, a, if we have a formula that's based on economic conditions and not revenues, there's less of a danger of that. And also the deductible and coinsurance um, would limit overutilization of the fund. Um, if we're concerned about adverse selection or only states that would actually use the fund uh, signing up to participate, then we could make it uh, universal or required um, to participate. So um, there are obviously all kinds of trade-offs with setting up a program like this. I think our motivation is that these so-called 100-year events or 100-year floods seem to be happening more and more frequently, the Great Recession and uh, COVID are both things that we thought would be, um, you know, never seen in our lifetimes, and now we have two in a decade. Uh, there's also some evidence that Medicaid enrollments and taxes are also growing more volatile with respect to the economy, and that puts states that are not necessarily um, built to absorb risk in a position where they're absorbing a lot of fiscal risk um, with repercussions for the larger economy, as the two previous speakers have mentioned. Um, so the debate, as Richard said at the beginning about the SALT cap repeal, is really an opportunity to rethink the whole federal state local relationship. And I understand that you know, there are winners and losers under any proposal um, to the states that benefit a lot from the SALT deduction, a bird in the hand rather than some hypothetical program uh, is worth more uh, to them right now. Um, but I do think that the value of risk protection is going to become more and more important and greater than the cost of setting up something new like this. So thanks very much. And I will turn it over to the other Josh. Thanks, Tracy. All right, so I'm gonna be a bit uh, less about rainy days and more about sort of everyday problems with uh, our, our current set of, of fiscal federalism. Um, so my starting point is this idea that COVID reveals states were just not equipped to deal with increased unemployment uh, and the need of income support uh, to keep people afloat. So we've had some innovative clutches like uh, the unemployment top off, uh, the relief checks, but I don't think they're a really good substitute for state administrative infrastructures that can be activated pretty quickly. 
Uh, so some people will note that we, we have programs like TANF and, and some states have general assistance programs. So it's worth examining why they didn't really help in this case. So I'm gonna focus on, on two issues here. The first one is this idea that federal support is inadequate and in leaves states bearing too much of the fiscal burden. It's been a theme today. But also I wanna focus on this idea uh, that existing allocation is enormously inequitable. So you can see a lot of maps from me. I love maps. My daughter loves Dora the Explorer. So I think that tells a lot of the story. So the first problem is um, of inadequate federal support. So uh, a lot of people know the story of AFDC as a matching grant, which converted to a block grant in 1996. Uh, and at the time, states received about 16 and a half billion based on spending circa 1996. Uh, the program or the value of that block grant is uh, not automatically adjusted for inflation and population growth. So it was 16.5 billion in the 90s and a 16.5 billion today. If it had been properly adjusted to keep pace with inflation and population growth, it'd be close to about 27 billion today. So that amounts to a 42% decline in the real value of the grant for, for states. So this is um, only for, for families with children. If we think about uh, this recession uh, and all the folks who are unemployed who uh, are able-bodied adults without dependents, um, the, the story is even worse. So the U.S. has never had any federal support for general assistance programs. Uh, so it needs to say uh, that's even more inadequate than, than what we see with, with TANF. The second issue is uh, the allocation across states. So rather than base funding on fiscal capacity or population, the TANF block grant formula as it exists today is an inaccuracy of the old system that replaced it. Uh, the previous system used the FMATCH, FMAP matching formula which for a lot of reasons I can get into later, ended up favoring wealthy states over poor states. So when it was converted into a block grant, policymakers simply froze the existing federal funding allocation, and this had the effect of locking in previously existing inequities. So this was exacerbated by differential uh, growth in the population under 18 across states, uh, because TANF block grant is allocated on a per state rather than per capita basis. So we'll see states like Nevada have seen a lot more children. Uh, states like uh, Vermont have seen the number of children actually decline. So that's going to increase or uh, exacerbate these inequalities. Furthermore, we actually see the opposite of what you might expect from a, a progressive federal system. Uh, the way that it locked in these existing inequities, um, New York, which is a very wealthy state, receives almost five times as much per child as Mississippi, which is a, a very, very poor state. So this is uh, extremely regressive. It exacerbates income and racial inequality. Uh, in a, a good system, we would actually see the opposite here. So we wanna see them inversely correlated. We see them positively correlated. So the problem is that you can imagine is, is worse for general assistance programs. Uh, some support is, is better than no support, but with general assistance, there's no support at all. So you can imagine Mississippi is gonna have a lot more trouble funding a, a system of general support than, than New York without any, any federal assistance. Uh, so the question is, is this an inevitable outcome of block granting programs? So this is, uh, I'm a sociologist. This is sort of common sense that if you block grant a program, uh, something bad will happen. Uh, I'm a comparativist by training. So the first thing I always do is look to Canada, uh, which I think tells us a whole lot about what's going on. I think Canada's experience suggests that the answer is no, this isn't something that's inevitable. So most people don't realize that Canada uh, had similar social assistance uh, matching grants leading into the 1990s. And in 1996, Canada block granted their social assistance uh, federal funding. But they did so very, very, very differently. So in the U.S., some things we've talked about, uh, we only cover family with children's allocated to states based on spending in the 1990s, uh, not indexed for inflation. And what we've seen is a declining reach in benefit levels. So TANF, uh, some people have declared it dead. I think it's, it's still alive a little, but uh, it's clearly declined a lot over the past 25 years. Canada looks very, very, very different, right? So uh, families with children are eligible, but also able-bodied adults without dependents. Uh, it's allocated to provinces on a per capita basis, uh, and they've legislated an automatic 3% increase, which has been higher than the inflation rate. 
So what we've seen in Canada, right, even though they block granted at the same time, is these programs have been relatively stable in terms of their reach and their benefit levels. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And the other big thing, uh, this is, uh, I love pointing this out, that we talk about the SALT deduction in US federalism as it's uh, sort of given. But the reality is most, or pretty much as far as I know, all other federal countries don't have a SALT deduction. They've never had a SALT deduction. Right? So this idea that if we take away the SALT deduction, you won't have any spending on, on a subnational level. I think Canada, Australia, Germany, all the other countries that have never had this deduction show that's just really not the case. So what can we do about it? Uh, I, it's a pretty simple plan. Uh, we just copy Canada. Uh, it's, it, it's not original, but I think it's, it's really useful. So what does that entail? Uh, first, we could eliminate the SALT deduction. These are just back of the envelope numbers and use those revenues to increase uh, total funding for state social assistance programs. Uh, we could then expand federal support to general assistance for able-bodied adults without dependents. This is something we've never done. Canada's done this since 1966. I think we should join that club as well. So we could take all of that funding, close to uh, $36 billion, uh, and allocate it on equal per capita basis uh, for those under 65. So anyone who might potentially be eligible, SSI covers the elderly, um, so we wouldn't need to include them, uh, and index that for inflation to make sure that it doesn't erode again in the future. Right? And we would see some pretty significant shifts over time if we did that. So uh, this would be about 130 per capita under 65 to um, each uh, state. So this would be deficit neutral. Um, it would actually make the system a lot more progressive, right? So the SALT deduction we know is, is pretty regressive. It goes primarily to high income people. Uh, social assistance primarily goes to, to low income people. So we would see uh, progressive in terms of income, but also progressive in terms of gearing that money better towards states with, with lower fiscal capacity. So you can see states like uh, Texas or, or Mississippi would see a huge increase in the amount of support they get from the federal government. Uh, based on these numbers, we, we would have two states that are, are doing pretty well for themselves. Um, New York is one and uh, the District of Columbia is another one. So uh, we could make sure that they don't actually lose money from this, but under this scheme, they wouldn't actually get any new funding. Um, but most states would see five or six times what they're, they're getting now. So uh, this would also have the benefit of bringing the U.S. in line with other rich democracies in regard to, to fiscal federalism. So no other uh, countries have a SALT deduction. Most will have a, a broad, either proportional or uh, progressive set of federal support for social assistance. Uh, and this would do both of those. So it, it wouldn't help with any of the rainy day issues we're talking about. It's really just fixing what I think is one of the major, major flaws of American federalism by simply looking at what the rest of the world is doing and bringing us in line with them. So uh, I will leave it there and I will turn it over to Bill. Uh, okay, uh, thank you all very much for uh, for stimulating talks. Uh, I have a few questions and uh, there's some questions uh, that, that people have sent in. I guess the first thing I'd like to start with is uh, I, I was going to ask this anyway, and I was intrigued by, intrigued by Josh's graphs at the end. We tend to talk about states as if they're a, a monolithic sector. And in fact, there's huge variation. Uh, I'm just wondering, maybe this is for Louise, in the current environment, how would you characterize you know, states that are doing badly versus states that are doing well? Uh, how many fall into one category, you know, or another? I mean, I can imagine if like New York and California and Texas are doing badly, that's going to influence the aggregates, even if lots of other states are doing well. What what can you tell us about that in the current in the current downturn? So I haven't looked exactly at how many states are doing well economically versus not, but one of the things I can say is, well, first of all, we know California actually is doing pretty well. Uh, much better than they expected. The tech sector has done very well um, in this recession and therefore their revenues are quite high. Um, that wasn't included in any of my estimates. Like, oh, well, tech is gonna do great. Um, so, so, so that's one big, big state that's doing well. 
Um, in terms of the states that are not doing well, our states, as I said, very heavily dependent on tourism or oil revenues. Um, but the other thing is that the way that aid was dispersed, the, you know, and this relates to what Josh was talking about, the $150 billion coronavirus release fund had a minimum of $1.5 billion per state. That was just a huge amount of money for the small states. Um, if you looked at what they got, they got like 20% of their own source revenues in aid just from that. And so there was a really big difference um, in, in how generous aid was. So a lot of smaller states, I'm just not that worried about because their aid was quite large. And if they managed to use it, it there's no way their expenses went up as much as their aid, I don't think. So if they managed to use it, which I think they have, then I think they're in decent shape. So, um, so some of the big states, are, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't, off the top of my head, I can't tell you how Texas did. Um, but the small states are fine. I know California has done pretty well. Now, Tracy probably has a better sense. You're muted, say, Tracy. I thought they had taken this out of my hands. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so in our data, the average decline from March to October for all states was about five percent. Um, for states like uh, Texas and um, and Florida, it was greater than that. I think it was more like ten percent for Texas. It was like fifteen percent for Hawaii and a couple of other states. And then you had states that did better, like Idaho, and that could be, uh, well, that's their own revenues, but revenues were helped enormously by the federal assistance for individuals and businesses. And so I think that's another important difference between this recession and previous recessions. Um, and again, why um, having these automatic formulas either pegged to something like unemployment or personal income, if you think that's a better metric, um, is so important. All right, well, let's turn to these uh, automatic formulas. Uh... Uh, I understand the economic logic of them. I'm wondering a little bit about the politics. There's a, a you know, politi politicians want to get credit for things that they do. Uh, there's a there's a quote that I think uh, someone told me Senator Russell Long said, but I've never been able to track it down. But it's to the effect that a politician should never solve a constituent's uh, problems until he knows he has one. <laughs> and so the automatic stuff, uh, I mean, I get the economic logic. What, how do you assess the political uh, possibilities uh, of something like that? And this is for anybody. Yeah, anybody I'll come, who, who I'll jump in since, since I managed to unmute myself. Um, so I actually had a project um, that I was uh, planning in uh, February and March of this year, looking at barriers to enacting automatic stabilizers, because it seemed like going into this crisis, um, you know, all the economists and sort of thinkers on this issue were um, aligned on doing something on automatic stabilizers. And yet it seemed like there was just no political prospect for that happening. So I think part of it is what you said, that legislators like to legislate. Um, I think it's also demonstrating to a larger set of actors the importance of, uh, of certainty and creating some kind of confidence that the federal government will act and act quickly and reasonably. Um, so I think showing those trade-offs is very important as well as that the counterfactual is not no action, but poor fiscal stimulus, you know, fiscal stimulus that's designed by the seat of your pants. And so I think there might be structural improvements to things like CBO scoring of automatic stabilizers that could really help make them look more attractive. Uh, Josh? You are yeah, just, I mean, quickly, and the politics are hard, and I'm probably wrong about this, but I mean, part of it is convincing them that it's probably not in any incumbent's interest to be sitting on top of an economy that is really bad. Um, and so these are things that will keep the economy from getting really bad. And um, if you think that helps you as an incumbent, I mean, you know, to, to be really blunt about it, talking to sort of especially Democrats on the Hill right now and urging them to go too large rather than too small on COVID relief, like the 2010 midterms were a disaster for them. I think at least in part, because the economy was so bad and people did not think anything had been done to help them. And so this sort of solves that problem. And then two, I would say, you know, just cause they're automatic, doesn't mean you can't take credit for them every time they trigger. I mean, if you're someone who wants to talk about federal dollars going to your state, you can point to it. You like, that's a, we passed this thing a couple of years ago and it led to this much money coming to our state this year. So um, yeah, I think the idea that someone's gonna point out that that was three years ago and maybe you weren't on the committee that did that. I mean, just take credit for it. Mm -hmm. Great, um, let's 
We'll talk about state unemployment uh, insurance systems. Uh, in the pandemic, uh, un unemployment insurance from last summer, they ended up just tacking on six hundred dollars uh, because they did they did other things too. But but rather than making it proportional or dependent on anything else, they just tacked on six hundred dollars, allegedly because the unemployment insurance systems were so antiquated that they couldn't make those changes. Uh, that in, in, in then there's this sort of background issue that sub, some states want to make it hard uh, to get unemployment insurance and some uh, less hard. So the question is, uh, uh, given the key role of that as an automatic stabilizer and a kind of a humanitarian policy, uh, should we make that federal? Should we offer federal money to bolster the administration of state unemployment systems? I mean, it's, it seemed like kind of a uh, uh, disaster to me last summer. And I just, you know, what are your opinions about that? I mean, I think there's a good argument for making it federal. I mean, if you look at the adequacy of benefits across the states, some states are reasonable. Forget about just the administrative stuff. And some states are just completely unreasonable. They're not providing adequate unemployment insurance. Um, so that either says, you know, change the rules, which then politically you can't get through or federalize it and make sure every state has adequate unemployment insurance that's related to their wages, but the replacement rate shouldn't vary so dramatically across states and the number of weeks that you can get shouldn't vary dr so dramatically across states. Great. Josh? I mean, I, I definitely support that. I do think federalizing it would solve a lot of problems. I think that the ones Louise just mentioned are, are the really key ones. I mean, I also just, I think it just makes the whole system less kludgy to have one sort of unified system of sort of minimum benefits as well as the financing. I mean, the UI financing system is pretty Byzantine with all of the state trust funds and they borrow from the federal government and then how that's, it just, there's a chance to have real economies of scale and how all of this is constructed along with making sure you're at least providing sort of a baseline level of adequacy. So. I think that should be the goal, whether or not we get there. There's lots of things you can do without full federalization, but boy, this seems like that should at least be the target at the outset. Okay, great. Other guys? Oh, oh, sorry, Tracy. No, no, go ahead. So I was gonna say uh, two advantages. Uh, in Canada, you have a, a federal unemployment uh, insurance system. And the two advantages there are, are one that's a bit more redistributive because uh, seasonal unemployment or places with higher unemployment tend to be have less fiscal capacity. So you see a lot of redistribution from like Ontario to the four Atlantic uh, provinces. Um, but also it helps with the provinces in terms of most people have um, access to unemployment insurance before they have access to social assistance. So you would go on IU if your benefits ran out that's when the province would step in. So that helps with uh, provincial um, finances as well. I'm just gonna say that, uh, you know, everyone has noted uh, rightly, uh, you know, the problems with IT at the state level and that they're relying on these very old systems and that's part of the reason for the backlogs. And so propose just more funding for IT and, and that as a solution. The only problem is that you're sort of layering that on the existing systems at the state level where, you know, I think as others have already pointed out, there are different politics already, there are differences in maximum weekly benefits. And there's some very good work basically showing that, you know, modernization is not only not a panacea, but can actually make things worse in terms of recipiency rates for people who are unemployed. It's a way of sort of aggressively keeping people off the rolls rather than finding people who need assistance and providing it to them. All right, great, thank you. Uh, Josh, I want to come. Josh McCabe, I want to come back to you. You mentioned Canada a couple of times uh, as as a as a constructive example. Uh, one of the things that is playing out in the U.S., of course, is issues of racial equity. And uh, if you look around, you can sort of find it everywhere. I'm wondering if uh, what your thoughts are and the differences in uh, uh, racial composition in Canada or U.S. and how that might play into uh, what policymakers are willing to, to do in terms of assistance? Yeah, so it's, it's, we have a sort of weird politics in the U.S. And so far as we, I think now we often talk about redistribution from blue states to red states, 
But, you know, one of the things I look at when I, when I see those maps is that um, we have wealthy blue states that are disproportionately white and poor red states that are also disproportionately black, right? So if you look at the, the, the black belt in the South, um, it's, it's really a matter, I think, racial justice of getting more money to those states, right? And I, and I think one of the issues we have is this, this, com this competition between ideology and um, interests, right? So it's uh, in Democrats' ideological interest to uh, funnel more money to Mississippi and, and Georgia, but it's also against their state interests, right? You want to send that money to Massachusetts, California, New York. Inversely, you know, Republicans uh, have an issue with uh, more federal spending, even though it would probably aid their state more than any other state. Uh, so I think it's an open question of what kind of coalition could you put together so that Republicans follow their interests and Democrats follow their, their ideology. Great. Anybody else uh, want to pitch in on that? No? Okay. Uh, there are a variety of issues like uh, climate change and infrastructure uh, that get talked about uh, at the federal level, but I think would largely be implemented uh, through the states. And uh, I'm wondering if there are particularly auspicious options you see there, particularly difficult obstacles. Uh, is there a policy that has to be done at the federal level versus one that would be better done at the state level? What, how should we think about these other policies in the context of federal state relations? Well, state and local governments already pay for about 80% of infrastructure. So like it or not, you know, any solutions to climate change and resilience are going to have to, you know, happen at that level. I think there are issues with um, project and selection, project selection and delivery in infrastructure. So, you know, you frequently hear people in Washington sort of inveigh against uh, states. Why aren't they borrowing more given that interest rates are so low? Um, you know, it really would help the economy um, per some of the um, statistics that we've been talking about. Um, you know, if they would have sort of juiced up their um, purchases right after the Great Recession. Um, you know, and I think that it's not clear where that marginal dollar spent on infrastructure will go. And so we really need to think about the funding formulas and incentivizing the right kinds of projects in the right kinds of places. Um, you know, all the ec econometric studies that show that infrastructure has a big bang for the buck are, you know, sort of predicated on this idea of sort of well-chosen projects and often involving projects that were built decades ago and not necessarily the ones that we would be building now, which would be things like, you know, sea walls or, um, you know, large infrastructure projects built to a different standard to withstand things like, uh, you know, rising sea level. So I do know that, you know, credit rating agencies are looking at this a lot more and it's something that's being taken into account. And actually, you know, to the extent that state and local governments do start building this stuff could be a real boost to the economy in the next several years. And I think the other thing to think about, I'm not an expert on this, but when you think about some of the policies like uh, any kind of regulation, regulatory policy that, that, you know, some states have tried to do it on their own, but then you worry about, you know, just having jobs leave and factories leave. And so when you think about a you know, carbon tax or any kind of, you know, cap and trade, like the national uh, solution is clearly better and you're not going to get states to decide, well, I'm going to just make it impossible for people to do business here if that's, if that's the, the, uh, what would happen so um yeah i would say as well on the financing front like especially in the climate context like investments that really do mitigate greenhouse gas emissions like the primary beneficiaries of that are future generations um if you're trying to think of a mechanism that borrows from the future to make investments today you know, that, that's deficit finance. That's something state and local governments just have much more limited capacity to do than the federal government. So to the degree you think um, that kind of thinking should be part of how we finance infrastructure investments aimed at climate change mitigation, I think that argues for a bigger federal role using debt to finance some of those. And can I make my standard little spiel, which is I agree with all that, but when I think when we're thinking about investing in the future, and um, this whole, sort of whole question, we have to remember just all, there's so much evidence uh, in recent years about how investing in poor families 
has these huge returns in the future, it's the same issue, which is a state doesn't know whose kids, you know, your, your, the kids may not live in your state. Mm -hmm. And so there are wonderful opportunities for investing to help the future that involve deficit financing investment that has to be done at the federal level. Right. In the sense, the federal government can capture the externality that the state government wouldn't if the kid, if the kid grew up and then moved. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so let's turn to the legislative uh, front. Uh, are we going to get another stimulus slash relief package? Is it going to have state and local assistance in it? Uh, are the people who have been pushing on reinstating the state and local deduction uh, likely to get anywhere? Yeah, no, I think there's, there's there's two countervailing forces. One makes me optimistic, one makes me pessimistic. Um, you know, I think we all look at Georgia and we see Georgia tends to be a lower fiscal capacity state. And now we have uh, Democrats in control of the Senate who, who now represent Georgia. And we, we, I think we have a bit more Southern Democrats than, than we did before. On the flip side, you know, leadership represents two of the, the wealthiest states in, in the country, uh, New York and, and California. Right, and there's going to be a pressure to sort of bring home the bacon to those states, which I, I think they they need it less. Um, so it'll remain to be seen: are, are we going to follow sort of a, a progressive uh, agenda that helps uh, poorer states, or are we going to do a progressive agenda that helps all states, but you know, New York and California just just a little bit more. You know, I mean, CBO found in its analysis of the aid that was provided in the COVID downturn that unrestricted state and local relief had the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and yet, you know, that was dropped at the 11th hour in the $908 billion bill that was passed um, last year. So I think the most important thing at that point in time was to get more aid to individuals and businesses um, for whom assistance was about to run out. Um, but I still am just surprised that that happened. Um, you know, the bill that was passed included a lot for K-12 education and for transportation. And as Louise pointed out, you know, that is beneficial for state and local governments that have to balance their budgets. I think we can probably expect more of the same in the next bill. Um, and that's because of this murky picture that some states are actually doing better than, not only better than expected, but better than they did in the previous year. California has a windfall of $15 billion. Um, on the other hand, Nevada, you know, the governor has instructed its agencies to prepare for cuts of 12% across the board. So there's just enormous uncertainty. You know, we have a new strain of the COVID virus, uh, you know, rising hospitalizations, and state and local governments are in this safety net provider role where they have to absorb that risk. You know, we've talked about ways to reallocate risk, but that's the status quo right now. Um, so, you know, I, I would like to see unrestricted aid in the bill, but I can understand the reasons that uh, that it might not be. I think providing something for the major spending categories that state and local governments are responsible for would be next best solution. Great. Uh, go, Josh, please. Yeah, I mean, I know what I read in the New York Times the same way everyone else does. I mean, I guess I'm, I agree with all that. I am strangely optimistic that there will be another bill before too long that will have some awfully flexible, if not completely unrestricted, but awfully flexible state and local aid. I think precisely because it's well known that people, that was the last thing to hit the cutting room floor before the $900 billion, as well as a big chunk of that $900 billion bill was sort of a re-up of the payroll protection program. I'm going to bet that's not going to be a big part of any new thing that rolls out in the next couple of months, because the thought will be, we, we did that, that'll get us through um, so I, I think in the very short run, I'm optimistic on that. I would bet as well that the entire like next bill that happens on COVID relief and recovery will probably be debt financed. So there'll probably be no tax. Well, there'll be some like, aside from things like refundable tax credits, there will be very little in the tax base. So I think we will not see an uncapping of the salt deduction in that. I do think keeping that cap going forward, I, I would not bet a ton on that. Um, that's gonna be a tougher one. Right. I think there will be unrestricted aid too. Probably not as much as they had, definitely not as much as they had talked about before, but I, I bet there will be some. And I think it's, you know, when we start to, to, talking about the ex, expiration of the TJ, whatever the tax and jobs cap, that's when I think the whole, that we'll see what happens with the, the, the cap, not, not as part of Biden's first year, I don't think. All right. Uh, 
that's excellent. Thank you to all the panelists uh, for a, real, a really interesting conversation. I, I confess that I learned a lot. Uh, thank you to Richard Reese for organizing it, for Anna, Dan, and Carl for their work behind the scenes. And thank you for everyone to everyone for uh, attending. Uh, so uh, that concludes our event and uh, we will reconnect soon. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank Take care, you. everyone. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.